Thanks for sticking with me in this course. This is the penultimate lecture. In this lesson, we'll look at resumes and see what to do and what to avoid. Well, what kind of job do you want? Better yet, let's ask what kinds of well-paying jobs will be available in the next 10 years. I don't think anyone will be surprised to hear that medical positions and tech lead the list. And anything related to finance and managing money comes third. So take that accounting class. There are few high-paying jobs, with the exception of being a physician, that do not require an understanding of finance. You know, this was just as true 40 years ago when I was considering a career. However, money was never high on my list. I wanted to do what I loved, and what I love is talking, listening, and reading. In fact, I did look at the possibility of being a lawyer, since that could have accounted for almost all my wishes, but I bailed on it when I saw the reading list. So I became a teacher instead, and later an academic manager, and I have never regretted my choice. What's the lesson here? You spend about 25% of your lifetime working, and about one-third of your life sleeping, adding up to more than half your breathing time on Earth. Go for what gives you joy. It's disheartening to a young person starting out to hear that at least 70% of people land their jobs through networking and not through applying for a posted position. How can you do such networking when you're young and barely out of college or university? Well, you can start right now when or if you're still in college. On this screen are a few suggestions. Join a college club, Saddleback, for example, has over 40 such clubs. Join a Toastmasters group near you, public speaking. Join one of the professional groups at Buzz Orange County, just Google it. Join the Orange County RBN, Relationship Building Network. Or join a professional association in your field and go to local meetings. Will resumes last? Yes. Okay, yes with qualifications. At the moment, LinkedIn rules the game of resumes and a professional presence. Take a look at the person Jerry Bauer, whose resumes is in this lesson. His LinkedIn profile is listed beneath this lecture. But when it actually came to applying officially to a job, the company he wanted to work for asked him to submit an actual Word format resume. Word? Yes. These days, most resumes never get to a human right away. They go through some version of applicant tracking system software to select which resumes to be forwarded to a human being and which ones to ignore. For that reason, Bauer loaded his resume with acronyms and current buzzwords. Cloud, deployment, revenue, competitive strategy, etc. The computer software was certain to pick this up. If you haven't done so already, stop this lecture and print out the two resumes in this week, Frydenberg and Bauer. Now, take a look at those resumes side by side. You will notice a few similarities. Both of the resumes are headed by name, address, and contact information. Both begin with a summary of experience, but not in complete sentences. And both people list their professional experience in reverse chronological order, most recent first. After that, they vary a lot because the two people have had completely different careers and accomplishments. Notice that the Bauer resume is four pages of tightly written job descriptions and accomplishments with lots of acronyms that only make sense within that profession, while the Frydenberg resume can be read by anyone. The two people's education is listed last. This is because both are old folks now, both in their 60s, and education just isn't very important anymore. If they were younger, or if they didn't have much professional experience, they might have listed their education first. 
The Frydenberg resume contains a few selected publications. The Bauer resume does not. Not many people publish in that field. The Frydenberg resume lists a few references because those are pretty well-known people in the field. But the Bauer resume does not because which references he would choose depended on the type of job he was looking at. Should you pay someone to write your resume? No. Well, maybe. No, I don't mean that. What I do mean is that I found it invaluable to have someone with a very different mindset look over my resumes those few times in my life when I've created such. Since I tend to be academic and wordy, I asked a marketing manager who adores short words and bulleted thoughts to review mine. The first time, she basically tore it to pieces. Then she wrote a professional summary that made me blush. I would never have said about myself that I was accomplished. That sounds too much like boasting. But of course she was right. That's what you do have to do to stand out in the crowd. Different writers have different opinions about what should be on a resume and what's best to leave off. Some say that you should omit your address if you're willing to relocate, since it might take a person in New York unwilling to look at your California resume. Others say leave it in. There are a few things just about everyone agrees on, and one of those is your email address. An address like hotstuffatme.com would be absolutely inappropriate. Go to Google and get yourself a professional email account with not, without too many letters in it. Try around until you have the shortest you can get. The second thing everyone agrees on is avoiding typos. Please, please, please have a native speaker who is good at grammar and spelling read your resume and cover letter. I've been on hundreds of search committees and read more than 10 times that in resumes. The minute I encountered a typo, I put that candidate in the no pile. It shows sloppiness and lack of attention. I won't hire that person. Are you on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest? Then you have an online footprint. Although I seriously doubt that a busy human resources person would spend time combing Facebook for your party pictures, I'm quite sure he or she would at least Google your name. Try Googling yourself. If you're the least bit horrified at what you find, start curating those sites. If you can find them, so can everyone else. Look into the site's privacy settings and find out if you can have subsites for friends and family. When I googled myself recently, LinkedIn came up second and Facebook fifth. We're back to the old adage, don't put anything online you wouldn't want to read on the front page of the New York Times. Most international students have lots of names and lots of spellings of those names. You have to decide on one or another in the U.S. Are you going to be Grace or are you going to be Lei Ping? Antonio or Tony? When I moved to the U.S. 35 years ago, I decided that no one could pronounce my name, so I told everyone to call me by my nickname. I have published under that name. I even get paychecks to that name. It isn't my full or real name, but for the purpose of an internet presence or for mail and email, it works just fine. Only the IRS and DMV know my real name, and I wish they didn't. Don't worry if your resume is short. This may well be the first time you're searching for a professional job in this country, or at all. Of course, you don't have much experience. Don't fall into the trap of throwing irrelevant things into your resume by mentioning how much you like cats or that you hate cilantro. But do add honest participation in networking organizations. That shows that you have enthusiasm and stamina. Nobody gets a job in the U.S. based only on a college degree and grades. 
get out there and network.